Welcome back to another of our Sabbath School series titled The Great Controversy Between Good and Evil. Our lessons this quarter are based on the book Great Controversy. You remember last week we noticed the fact that the Great Controversy is that theme that ties the entire Bible together. It takes us from Lucifer's fall in heaven and his rebellion against God to the restoration of God's throne in the new heavens and the new earth. So the great controversy is this all-encompassing theme, dealing with the fall of Lucifer from heaven, his casting out of heaven, the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Christ's promise of the Messiah, the sanctuary system in the Old Testament, and Israel's history in the Old Testament. The great controversy takes us through the whole Old Testament period. Then it goes into the New Testament with the coming of Christ, Christ's death for humanity, his Perfect, his perfect life, his death for humanity, the resurrection of Jesus, his, his ascension to heaven, his high priestly ministry, the early New Testament Christian church, the apostasy of the Middle Ages, the Reformation, the rise of the Advent movement, and the coming of Jesus, the restoration of God's eternal kingdom after the millennium. So it's, the great controversy is all-encompassing theme. Now, I'm I'd like to encourage you to read the book, Great Controversy, during this Sabbath School lessons. Uh, we're on lesson number two. We gave an introduction last week. Now we launch right into the book, Great Controversy. And um, this will be found, you can, if you want to read the corollary reading, you can go to the Great Controversy chapters one and two. Now, every one of our Sabbath School lessons is based on the Bible. But I do draw heavily from the Great Controversy and the insights there. But the lessons, of course, this is a Bible study period, so they are solidly biblical. I've titled lesson number two, The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness? And that's really the issue in the conflict between good and evil. Let's suppose that you are a herdsman. And you're living 2,000 years ago, a little more than that now, and you are herding your sheep up there by the Mount of Olives. And there's a flat plateau there, and as you are coming up, you see a man teaching a group of his disciples. And as he looks over the Kidron Valley down toward the temple there at Jerusalem, he says, not one stone's going to be left upon another. And you as a herdsman are just amazed. What's all this about? And Jesus begins to talk about the destruction of that temple at Jerusalem and the signs of the times. You would be absolutely amazed and I'm sure the disciples were as well, and they did not understand what was happening. They didn't understand how the temple could be destroyed. They didn't understand that Titus' armies would attack it. 70 AD, 35 years, 36 or so after Jesus spoke. They didn't understand all that. But as you and I look at that concept of the destruction of Jerusalem, we see in the destruction of Jerusalem a foreshadowing of the destruction of our world at end time. Now, we're going to look at Sunday's lesson. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem, his heart was broken. John's gospel said he came to his own and his own didn't receive him. Just think about the love that flows from Jesus' heart the tears that must have been in his eyes as he told his disciples that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, not one stone upon another. We find that lament or that cry in Luke chapter 19, 41 to 44. Luke chapter 19. You can almost hear when you read this passage, the sobs of Christ. You think of the fact of the depth of his love, the breath of his compassion, Luke 19, we're going to take a look at verse 41. And uh, Jesus, it says, now as he drew near, this is Christ is coming near the city just before his trial and crucifixion. He's coming near and it says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, verse 42, if you had known even you especially in this your day the things that make your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Verse 43, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. So here, Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He sees it. He makes the prediction that Titus and the Roman armies would come down and totally destroy the city. 
that event would happen some 36 years, 35, 36 years in advance. Christ looked with prophetic eye into the future. Bible prophecy does not guess. It knows. Now, it's difficult to understand an event as destructive as the devastation on Jerusalem in the light of God's loving character. History reveals, I'm looking at the note, Sunday's lesson, history reveals that tens of thousands died as the Roman army with General Titus led his armies against the city. Jerusalem was devastated. Men, women, and children were slaughtered. Where was God when his people suffered so greatly? Now, the answer is clear, but it's not easy to grasp. Where was God when his people suffered so closely? He was the brokenhearted God. He was the God that sobbed in Luke 1941, chapter 1941 of Luke. And uh, he was the God that, that sobbed then, but he was the God that was sobbing when it happened. He gave Israel possibility after possibility after possibility, sent prophet after prophet, sent his own son, but when the religious leaders rejected that and when they turned their backs on his love, he withdrew his protective presence and allowed their choices to play out in the destruction of Jerusalem. For centuries, I'm back to the note now, for centuries he reached out to his people. By their rebellion against his loving kindness, they forfeited his divine protection. God does not always intervene to limit the results of his people's choices. He allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. God did not cause the slaughter of innocent children in the destruction of Jerusalem. The tragic death of the innocents was Satan's act, not God's. Satan delights in war because it stirs the worst passions of the human heart. Down through the centuries, it's been his purpose to deceive and destroy and then do what? to blame his actions upon God. So what does Satan do? Satan wants to bring heartache and sorrow in your life. He wants to bring disappointment. He allows, he wants, Satan wants to have sickness. He wants to have accidents. He wants to have famine and a heartache and premature death. And then people say, where's God in all this? The truth of the matter is God was not in it at all. These were the acts of Satan not the acts of God. You know, in some insurance policies, it says this policy is covered except for acts of God. And, you know, the acts of God might be a flood, for example. The acts of God might be some natural disaster. It said, oh, insurance policy covers everything except the acts of God. What a misnomer. These are not acts of God at all. They are the acts of the evil one, the acts of Satan. We see in the destruction of Jerusalem, the slaughter of men, women, children, and innocent, we see God allowing the choice of human beings to play out. And we see God withdrawing his presence. And we see Satan viciously in that attack. But you say, where's God's love in all this? Why didn't God protect? You know, we see something amazing that reveals God's love in Matthew 24, verse 15 to 20. Here we have a hint of God's love. Here we have provisions, Matthew 24, verse 15 to 20. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. In other words, when the Roman armies are approaching, when they're surrounding the city, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field, not go back and get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. Pray that your flight not be in the winter on the Sabbath. Incidentally, why would Jesus say, pray your flight not be on the Sabbath if Israel was not going to be keeping the Sabbath? If God's people, if Christians were not going to be keeping it, spiritual Israelites, Christians, if they were not going to be keeping the Sabbath in 70 AD, why would he ever say, pray, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath? So this is good evidence that they still would be keeping the Sabbath. Why did he say that? Pray your flight not be on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath would all be gathered together. It would be easier for the Romans to attack them. So pray that it would not be on the Sabbath. But he said to them, look, when you see the Roman armies approaching, then I want you to flee. 
And in the destruction of Jerusalem, Christians were providentially preserved. We're going to go to Monday's lesson, first paragraph. God's mercy, grace, providence, and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Cestius Gallus and the Roman army surrounded the city. In an unexpected move, when their attack seemed imminent, they withdrew and the Jewish armies pursued them and won a great victory. So here, I want you to imagine this. Cestius Gallus surrounds the city. As he surrounds it, for some unknown reason, he withdraws. The Jewish armies pursue them. Now, so the Romans are fleeing, the Jewish armies are pursuing. What does that mean? The Christians flee. They go to a place called Pella, and they flee. Uh, Ellen White makes this wonderful statement in Great Controversy, the book Great Controversy, page 30. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians. What was that promised sign? When the Romans approach and they withdraw, you, ret you, you retreat. And now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the sa Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Why not? Romans were fleeing, the Jews were pursuing them, so the Christians fled. They got out of the city before the destruction. Not one Christian died in the destruction of Jerusalem. Where is God's love in all that? God's love is everywhere that it is. God's love is everywhere, reaching out. Think of it. Before he destroys the world with a flood, God sends Noah to preach for 120 years and build an ark for people to get in and be saved. You know, that was really a blueprint for an ark. Wouldn't God have been happy if there were 100 arks, 200 arks with scores of people in them? Sure. But people had a choice. But God made provision before the destruction. Think of Lot, Sodom. God was hastening Lot out of Sodom before the destruction. God sends a message of mercy, a message of grace, a message of love. He sent prophet after prophet to Israel. He sent John the Baptist to Israel. God sends a message of love in the last days, a message to get ready for the coming of Christ. There is an event coming that is cataclysmic as the destruction of Jerusalem, and that is the destruction of this world by fire. And uh, God is inviting men and women now to make eternal choices. God always sends a message of love, a message to prepare people for his soon return. God is providential in his care for us. You know, in Psalm 46, verse 1, it said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear that the earth be what be removed or the mountains carried into the midst of the sea. God is in the midst of her. He shall help her in that right early. Or think of Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. I am you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God said, yes, trials are going to come. Yes, difficulties are going to come. But he says, don't fear. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. Here, in Monday's lesson, Christians are providentially preserved. But there's, a, there's an interesting passage in Hebrews 11, verse 35 to 38. Hebrews 11. We're going to compare two passages. First, Hebrews 11. 35 to 38, and how do, we, how, how do we harmonize these two passages? Does God always protect? Does God always deliver? Does God always keep us from sickness, suffering, heartache, or death? Hebrews 11, 35 to 38, it talks about women receive their dead, raised to life. What a miracle. Somebody dies, a son, a daughter, and they're raised to life. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Wait a minute. Some receive their dead, and others are tortured but they could obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, tormented. Now, earlier in verse 34, that they escaped the edge of the sword, and how do you harmonize that with verse 37? They were slain with the sword. We are not playthings of the devil. God only allows certain events to take place because we're in a wicked, evil world if ultimately it will advance his cause, bring glory to his name. In other words, 
we are not just darts of the devil that the devil throws can throw darts at us like he like a like some kids throwing at a dart target not at all god is our refuge and strength we're in his hands god will bring good out of every circumstance that comes to us if we if these individuals died by the sword they died in faith clinging to the promises of god and they were a powerful witness to people around them if they lived and were protected in the face of torture and persecution they their lives glorified god so life is not a matter whether we live or die whether we have or have not whether we are sick or healthy whether we are wealthy or poor in spite of all of that our faith trusts god and in that trust we grow and grow in god what you say well what about a tragic or auto accident what about people that die in war or plane crash god allows in this wicked sinful world at times tragedies and heartache to happen to good people but in all of that we are to the living are to long for eternity more if you've lost a son or a daughter a husband or a wife by death jesus invites you to long for eternity to look forward to the day that there will be no sickness suffering heartache or death so we find in the destruction of Jerusalem God making provision for Christians but we should never think that Christians never get sick never die never have heartache never have sorrow this the evil in the world makes us long for a world where there is no evil the sickness in the world makes us long for a world where there is no sickness the suffering in the world makes us long for a world where there is no suffering the heartache in the world makes us long for a world where there is no heartache and the death in the world makes us long for a world where there is no death in tuesday's lesson christians are faithful amid persecution that's the key the key in this week's lesson is faithfulness to god the key in last week's lesson was choice the key in this week's lesson is faithfulness to god tuesday's lesson throughout the early centuries of christianity the christian church grew rapidly despite imprisonment torture and persecution faithful believers totally committed to Christ filled with the holy spirit proclaimed the word of god with power lives were changed and tens of thousands were converted look at just just look at those chapters in the book of acts here men and women are faithful yes they're being persecuted tormented uh, uh, oppressed placed in prison but what's happening acts 2 verse 41 then those who gladly received his word were baptized that same day 3000 were baptized acts 4 verse 4 how be it many of those who heard the word believed the number of men came to be about what 5000 acts 5 verse 32 or verse 42 acts 5 verse 42 and daily in the church and in the temple they did not cease teaching and preaching Christ acts 6 verse 7 the word of god spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem a great many of the priests the religious leaders are obedient to the faith i mean you go go through the book of acts thousands and thousands of being baptized why what's leading them they see the faithfulness of the christians as one christian writer said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel they see that faithfulness the uh, tuesday's lesson first paragraph underneath the section about reading from the book of acts acts 2 4 5 which we've just gone over the disciples faced threats imprisonment persecution yet in the power of the holy spirit courageously proclaimed the resurrected christ and the churches multiplied throughout judea galilee and samaria the bastions of hell were shaken the shackles of satan were broken pagan superstition crumbled before the power of the resurrected christ the gospel triumphed in the face of overwhelming odds the disciples no longer cowered in the upper room fear danced away like a shadow our lord had given them not only the great commission but the great promise and they went out and proclaimed the living christ and thousands and tens of thousands came to christ and the christian church grew 
Now, the early church was not only a proclaiming church. It was a church that shared God's love and shared its resources with others. It was a caring community. Let's look at a few passages. See, the, it's not on this hand we proclaim and do not care, and it's not on this hand we care and do not proclaim. It's not that we go out and provide the gospel for people that are spiritually hungry, but don't provide food for those that are physically hungry. The essence of the ministry of Christ is that Christ is concerned with the whole person, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We see this in the New Testament church, and that's one of the reasons why the New Testament church grew so rapidly. If you look, for example, at Acts chapter 2, verse 40. 4 through 47. Now let's look at some passages in this week's lesson that show the totality of the ministry of the church, the caring, loving ministry of the church. Acts 2, verse 44 to 47. Now all, believe, all who believe were together, and they had all things in common. They shared. There was a sharing church. Some sold their possession and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And daily, with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. What does this show us? It shows us that the unselfish ministry of Christ triumphed. The New Testament church cared for one another. Where there were those in Hungary that were hungry, they supplied it food. Where those that needed lodging, they helped them to find it. They had a camaraderie together. They shared one another's burdens where those that were emotionally bruised and hurt, there were listening ears to, give, to, to listen to their woes. There were encouraging words to encourage them. We find in the book of Acts this, these provisions being made for the church. You look at Acts chapter 3, you have a healing ministry. Um, Peter and John are going into the temple. There's a man that is lame from birth that's begging there. He wants money. The church meets more than its expectations. They give him more than money. They didn't, don't, simply don't dole out some coins to a little tin cup. They give him more. Peter looks at him and he says to him, verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but, I, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up, take your bed and walk. So here Peter says, get up and walk. What does this show us? Does it show us that in every earth circumstance of life that we are to tell people who are sick, get up out of your bed? Not at all. What it shows us is that Peter and John cared for that man physically and that the church is to have a ministry of physical healing. Now, God can heal in a variety of ways. God can heal instantaneously. Sometimes God works a direct miracle. I've seen him do that, and he heals people miraculously. Sometimes we've seen that in anointing services. I remember once we were anointing a lady with, who had cancer, and we anointed her, and God blessed miraculously, and this woman was eventually healed and went out and did mission service. On other times, I've anointed people that have had cancer, and they've died. So God can heal in three ways. One, he can heal instant. Two, he can heal gradually through modern medicine. Three, he can heal in the resurrection. We leave how and when he heals to God. There are many natural remedies that God has given to provide healing for his people today. And uh, we look to those natural remedies as well as we look to modern science. So God's concern in this passage, this Acts passage is this. Just as the church has a ministry reaching out to feed, to house, to bless people, so a caring church has a health ministry that helps people to keep well and stay well to reduce the risk of disease, as well as a spiritual ministry that prays for them, as well as a total ministry of health that is, or, or healing rather, a total ministry of healing when they get sick. So, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a total, complete ministry of healing and health. Our churches typically have health ministry directors, and a church is reaching out into the community with health programs, five-day plans to stop smoking, wellness programs, 
uh, programs that have to do with reducing stress, natural lifestyle cooking programs, reaching out to the community so the community can be a healthier place, exercise classes so the community can be living to that healthy hundred. But the church also has an extensive system of hospitals, the health ministry through our hospitals, reaching out with caring doctors, caring nurses that are praying for people. The church also has the emphasis on natural healing as far as possible, using God's methods of healing uh, in a rational way that have been scientifically demonstrated to make a major difference in health. You know, in the book, The Blue Zones, by Dan Buettner in National Geographics, Buettner points this out very interestingly. He said, the longest places that are living in the world are getting adequate exercise. They have wonderful uh, plant-based diet, largely. Some of them eat a little meat, but mostly a plant-based diet. They have, in addition to that, pure water that they're drinking. They are temperate in their lifestyle, wonderful family connections. Uh, that uh, build their health with strong community. And of course, most of them have a spiritual, some kind of spiritual life or spiritual community. God is working powerfully through the health ministries of his church. And so we see here that the church was a caring community in the New Testament. Look, for example, at Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. There was a murmuring. What was the murmuring? It was against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Why? Who were the Hellenists? They were Greek Christians and the Greek Jews that became Christians because they believed that their widows were neglected. So what did, what did the apostles do? They had this, they appointed a small group and this small group so, sorted out the problem so the widows would get adequate food. The church is a proclaiming community. The church is a preaching community. But in the great controversy between good and evil, as we model God's love, as we demonstrate God's love, as we share God's love in practical, tangible ways, it impacts the lives of those people upon whom we are attempting to witness to. Um, here, what the early Christian church grew, Wednesday's lesson, first paragraph, the early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but they lived the gospel. Believers modeled the ministry of Christ who went about through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. Jesus deeply cared for people, and so did the New Testament church. Next sentence is critical. It was this unselfish love and commitment to meeting human needs combined with sharing the good news of the gospel and the Holy Spirit's power that made such an impact on the world in the early centuries of the Christian church. What did the Christian church leave? It left a legacy of love. John 13, verse 35. What did the Christian church leave? It left a legacy of love. John chapter 13, verse 35. This is why it grew so rapidly. This is why Satan hated it so much. The church went out filled with the love of Christ. Individual members charmed by love, redeemed by grace, transformed by the power of the Spirit, went out preaching the gospel, living the gospel, sharing the gospel of love, modeling the selfless self-sacrificing, serving ministry of Christ. John 13, verse 35 puts it this way. It says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 1 John 4, verse 21. What is it that will convince the world of the truth of the gospel? What gave such power to the early New Testament Christian church? 1 John 4, verse 21. And this commandment we have from him, from Christ, he who loves God must love his brother. Is there, are there practical examples of this being demonstrated in early Christianity? There are. There were two great plagues that came through during the early centuries. One was in 160 AD, and the other was a little later than that period, in about, eight, about 100 years later, actually, in AD 260. 
one of the greatest revelations of God's love, I'm looking here in Thursday's lesson, second paragraph, one of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around A.D. 160 and A.D. 260. Christians stepped forward. They ministered to the sick and dying. The plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the population. Over time, tens of thousands, millions in the Roman Empire became Christians. Why? Because the Christians preached the truth and they lived the truth. Rodney Starkey, Rodney Stark has written a book called The Rise of Christianity. It's a modern historical narrative portraying these historic events in the plagues when the Christians ministered. And um, Starkey quotes Dionysus, and he says this uh, in, the, in his book, The Rise of Christianity. Dionysus was one of the uh, early uh, Romans, and he writes a lengthy tribute to the he he heroic nursing efforts of the lo local Christians, many of whom lost their lives while caring for others. And um, Dionysus writes this way. He says, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves in thinking only of one another. So here Dionysus, this Christian out of Rome says, look, most of our brothers Christians, they showed unbounded love. They showed loyalty. They never spared themselves thinking only of one another. We go on. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were affected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. So these early Christians went out where the pagans threw their loved ones into the streets to die because they didn't want to be affected by the disease. The Christians went out, took them out of the streets, ministered to them. That unselfish love so impacted the society in the, early, in the second and third century that thousands became Christians. In the great controversy between good and evil, God calls us to make a choice. A choice to be faithful to him. Faithful to the truths of his word. Faithful to te the teachings of scripture. He calls us to be obedient to his commands. And he calls us to preach his truth to the ends of the earth. But he calls us also to live his truth. To unselfishly, kindly minister to others. To reach out to others in a compassionate ministry that is life transformational. That is the call of Jesus, and that's the appeal of our lesson this week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you with all of our hearts as we see the Christian church grew so rapidly. Oh, Lord, help us to be faithful to you in our personal lives, to be committed to you, to have our hearts beat with your heart, our minds beat with your mind, one with your mind, and help us, dear Father, to share the message of your love with others. May we see the life-transforming power of the gospel work in us so it can touch other lives. And dear Jesus, help us model the loving, sacrificial kindness in the ministry of Christ to people around us so they can see you as well as hear the message of your truth. They can see you in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.